Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, today, New Zealand's Prime Minister has also called for a global fight to weed out extremism. But in an age where intolerance can flourish across borders through the internet, just how should that be done? We've been to Glasgow to meet a man behind a media operation, pumping out stories that are often hostile to immigration. He admits being deliberately provocative, but denies being anti-Muslim or far-right. Our Scotland correspondent Kieran Jenkins reports. There are people who so distrust the news, they make their own. The web is awash with alternative media. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. That's unashamedly partisan. It that the British people are sick and tired of mass immigration. It's Maybe unchecked, unaccountable. We have to be deliberately provocative. But is it fueling divisions? or potentially even worse. You don't feel responsible for people who may read your content and get ideas in their heads. No. We're taking you to see a small part of a global phenomenon, as alt news is in the news and under scrutiny. If you've ever wondered where this stuff comes from, the unlikely answer in this case is a storage facility on the outskirts of Glasgow. Hello. David Close. Kieran. Good to meet you. How are you Thank doing? You, thanks for coming along. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Good, good, good. We're meeting David Clues of Unity News Network. He has his camera out to film us. You're recording us recording Well, you. yeah, that's right. Well, we live in a surveillance world, isn't it? This is our newsroom. And this is where you're going to sort of broadcast your take on the news to the world. Correct. We believe in Brexit. We believe in controlling immigration. We believe in making Britain a better country. We don't deny that. David is one of the faces of Unity, a campaign that's shifted somewhat from its origins opposing Scottish independence. Now David and co-anchor Carl, chair of UKIP Scotland Youth Wing, talk Brexit. Well, the people had a vote on yep. Brexit and we're absolutely sick of these elitists coming out and telling us that our vote counts for nothing. And themes you might easily hear on the alt-right media in the USA. We use imagery and things like that that is perhaps slightly more sensationalist. But once you actually listen to what we're trying to say and you look at our writing, we try and produce a more nuanced approach to it. We've had over a million people visit from the UK, yep. Visited your site? Visited the site, yep. At home in his flat, David takes us through the website's most popular stories. What was the headline of that? Then? Um, British schoolgirl film being attacked by a group of ethnic children. Why is the schoolgirl British, but the people attacking her ethnic? Surely they, they could all have been British. Um, yes, but... So why have you not written British schoolgirl attacked by British children? Because that's what happened. David is anxious to argue he's not far right. Mm -hmm. Did you put this together? I made this video, yeah. What does that say? Well, what it's saying is that if we continue with the level of mass immigration from Islamic countries, that there will be, Europe would potentially become an Islamic country. But you know, don't you, that that isn't true. It's not, Europe is not going to look like this in 20 years. Look, look at that. What, what are we looking at? You tell me. Well, that's actually Mecca, um, because the Kaaba's in the middle there, but Europe could could look like that. Europe is going to look like Mecca in 20 years? Well, if... if but my point is, though, surely people want to control their borders, and people are concerned about that's the rise of Islamic That's not what you're Islamic saying in this video. You're saying that our culture will be completely overridden by Islamic culture in 20 years to the extent that it will look like Mecca. And now you're telling me that you genuinely believe that. No, I'm not saying I genuinely believe that. I'm saying it's a possibility. I want to know if David fears his words have consequences, whether his content could actually inspire attacks. Maybe they lash out at, at somebody of the Muslim faith because they think that they're genuinely under well, why, threat. Why, well, that why they genuinely... Because there is anger, as you say, no, they, they feel that their society is going to look like this in 20 years because people like you are telling them that. Do you feel any responsibility 
for the hatred that there is out there when you know it's that's not real that's not true i i i have no responsibility for the hatred out there i am attempting to come up with a peaceful and rational argument David reflects later that this content was overly provocative and over the top. But Unity News is packed with themes Welcome of violence and crude depictions of Islam and immigration. Constant rampant crime will continue to plague our capital until we stop important cultures into the capital that don't agree with British values. Can't you see that's an opinion? Broadcasting something like that could inflame tensions and encourage hatred and intolerance and even abuse and attacks of minorities. What in this you country. do could do the same. You have a news channel. You're telling people this is happening. No, but you're without but any, is, without any thing basis is so, in thing fact. Is so, no, but you are now pushing an agenda. And not only that, you're pushing an agenda. You're blaming it on foreigners. No. David used to be a conservative, then Labour councillor. He now runs Unity News full time and insists it's funded by loans, small donations and merchandise. But what's shaping his ideas? By his own admission, not the world around him here. What is your own experience of immigration here in Scotland? Well, my, 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 my wife is actually Polish. You know, she comes from um, Poland. She's coming to work. My wife is Polish. Polish yeah. She's a Polish she migrant. Yes. Yeah. Well, she came here to, to work and, and you know, I've my, my debate about, about the EU free movement of people is that it is a ridiculous concept. Would you introduce controls that would mean that perhaps your wife wouldn't have been able to have come to well, it? Uh, yeah, and, and you know, I get, I get tested on that question. It's the evening Parliament votes on delaying Brexit. David wants us to meet one of his young followers. It's inspirational stuff that makes you actually think about yeah. the raw facts. The grooming gangs thing is big. Is there a sense yeah. that that's been covered up as well? Yeah, it has. Is there a sense that like, things like Sharia TV. law, yeah. etc., is going on and it it's not been talked on, but about? No one cares about it. We're the victims, like I said. Where does that sense come from? Do you think that the perception you get from reading your website is that Muslims are responsible for crime, Muslims are responsible for gang attacks, Muslims are responsible for child abuse? Do you think that's a re an accurate reflection um, of the world in which we live? Mm, no, because you've just taken one topic in one section. So, but that'd be, but, 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 but here, but here, David, you write about this more than almost anything no. else. In the following days, David deletes some content and publishes a new code of ethics. He believes he is a moderating influence. My argument is if we keep going down this road of, of open borders of m rampant political correctness, people will become even more and more and more radical. And the stuff that we've produced will seem like Disneyland. And that worries me. But doesn't the truth worry him? Truth is subjective. You know, what did Humpty Dumpty say? Words mean what I want them to mean. Truth is a subjective form. I, I, I am not a believer in fact. No, I'm not saying I'm not a believer in facts, but what people, as I say, this is perception based. Is this perception or gross distortion? Alternative media for alternative realities. Thanks, everyone. We'll look forward to speaking to you soon. And the repercussions, says David, are all on you. Well, I'm joined here by Mariam Mahmood, who's a research associate at the University of Oxford, looking at prejudice against Muslims and Jews, and from Birmingham by Chris Allen, an expert on the far right in Britain and Europe. Welcome to you both. Mariam, can I start with you? When you see a report like that and you mm -hmm. see that character, using inflammatory language, talking about migrants and Muslims in that way. What do you feel? Is it fear? A couple of things. Um, firstly, I think it's very important to contextualise this, this sort of speech and all that we're seeing, this implosion um, of uh, this sort of hateful rhetoric, vilifying communities, vilifying ordinary people who are Muslim um, in the global context this rise of populism that we've seen across the world, be it Brazil, Austria, India. And I think what's necessary is to have a, an, an honest conversation about this, whereby we actually try and understand why is it that we have mainstreamed and normalized such hateful rhetoric. So it's not just about alternative websites? Definitely not. I think this is the point where freedom of speech 
and hate speech collide. You know, when we talk about freedom and uh, sort of absolutism of free speech, that's where the lines are quite blurred. And that's where we need to actually actively distinguish between, you know, respectful um, uh, sort of viewpoints about communities, about um, sort of individuals. Critiquing an ideology is one thing. Vilifying people who subscribe to that ideology is another, and that's what is the, the clarification needs to be made. Do you see a direct link between websites and YouTube and etc. videos that that use this sort of language and attacks on the street? Definitely. You know, people are sitting there in an age of social media, especially, um, they're feeling far more emboldened. They're far braver sitting behind that computer screen. You know, and uh, everything about the New Zealand attack, especially the way it was live broadcast. Um, this is where, you know, social media platforms really need to take an active role in monitoring and preventing the spread and dissemination of such hateful and violent um, sort of criminality. Mm. I want to bring in Chris Allen on that point. Chris, you've tracked yeah. far-right movements, alt-right movements for a number of years. How has technology changed the way they operate? Well, I think what we've found is that it's become increasingly transnational. And so the, the Internet has kind of um, uh, facilitated that. You see now groups in this country which are no longer separatist, you know, working with those in Eastern Europe, working with those in North America, working with those in Scandinavia and elsewhere around the world. And so the Internet really has, and social media in particular, has opened up a whole new space where kind of these kind of extreme right populist, rather than far right, I would say, um, kind of ideologies have been able to really kind of spread and gain uh, increasing credence. So if people are able to peddle hate across borders, how difficult is it then to tackle it? How indeed should it be tackled? Well, I think it is increasingly difficult to, to, to look at this as, as a transnational issue. But I think that one of the things that we can say is that in this country, if we look at uh, as this year, for example, it's the 10th anniversary of the formation of the English Defence League. And if you look at the issues around Islamophobia and some of the discourses and the stereotypes that have been put forward about Muslims and Islam in this country, and also the way in which someone like Tommy Robinson, who was the former leader of the English Defence League, has been able to kind of find a, a platform within the mainstream media to the extent where what he says and what he does and who he is becomes increasingly normalised. And so this really is problematic because actually that provides the gateway. You know, Tommy Robinson isn't going to be someone who's going to advocate violence. He isn't going to advocate going into a mosque and, and you know, committing hideous atrocities like we saw in Christchurch. But what it becomes, it becomes the way in which people engage with these ideas. And so actually in the local level, in the national level, I think that's where we can act. And, you know, we've seen now, we are finally beginning to kind of take the threat of the, you know, extreme right, um, extreme right wing actually seriously. We can see that with the PREVENT program beginning to respond to the actual threat that's, that, that, that the far right presents to our domestic security. Okay. Mariam, you study uh, historical precedents on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia indeed. Do you think we are now in a dangerous place compared to where we have been historically? I think um, it is worth drawing comparisons and contrasting the way in which prejudice, discrimination and stigmatization of individuals and communities function now and it has, has been done in the past. Granted, there are certain historical contingencies in, um, with regards to the case. I study particularly Weimar anti-Semitism. And what I can tell you is the scapegoating and vilification of Jews in that era parallels quite a lot with what's happening to Muslim communities at the moment. Uh, I'm not suggesting that, you know, this is, uh, I'm not trying to fear monger. Mm. However, this ne needs to be taken seriously. At the same time, I do want to stress that alongside the sort of the rise of fascism in, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, there was a strong movement against it. Mm. And I'm seeing that now, now as well with people combining forces, whether they're religious groups, LGBT plus groups, mm. all sorts of people on the base of humanity. So a hopeful note to end Definitely, on Definitely, that's what I would Very like. Mahmoud and Chris Thank Allen, you. thank you very much.